Welcome back to the Slow Flowers Podcast with Deborah Prinzing, episode 487. This is the weekly podcast about slow flowers and the people who grow and design with them. It's all about making a conscious choice, and I invite you to join the conversation and the creative community as we discuss the vital topics of saving our domestic flower farms and supporting a floral industry that relies on a safe, seasonal and local supply of flowers and foliage. This podcast is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 800 florists, shops, and studios who design with local seasonal and sustainable flowers and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor for 2021, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap-wrapped bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting more than 20 U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $9 million of U.S.-grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually and providing competitive salaries and benefits to 240 team members based in Watsonville, California and Miami, Florida. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. For each podcast episode this year, we'll also thank three of our major sponsors. Our first thanks goes to Johnny's Selected Seeds, an employee-owned company that provides our industry the best flower, herb, and vegetable seeds supplied to farms large and small, and even backyard cutting gardens like mine. Find the full catalog of flower seeds and bulbs at johnnysseeds.com. This forecast began seven years ago in 2014 when I began documenting shifts and changes in the slow flowers movement. I recently described the origins of this important exercise in my new online course, Taking Stock and Looking Ahead. And P.S. Check out the link in today's show notes to learn how you can take this free course as my gift to you. Here's how I remember it. In 2014, when I launched slowflowers.com as an online directory of American flowers and the growers and florists who supplied them, I worked with two talented public relations friends to get the word out to the media. While planning a visit to meet with Lifestyle and Garden Magazine editors in New York, one of the PR experts urged me to create a PowerPoint slide deck that included an overview of floral trends I associated with the emerging slow flowers movement. In creating that deck, which became my first forecast for 2015, I learned a few important lessons, and I share this in the context of the social media term imposter syndrome, because it's no surprise we all feel that sometimes. When Lola and Marla encouraged me to write a trend forecast, at first I thought, who am I to forecast trends? Isn't that a role for the experts? Their response was this. You have a point of view, and it's based on hundreds of interviews that you conduct for articles and for your podcast over the course of each year. See what bubbles up from those topics and themes that excites you about the year to come. I realized that since I was the one who conducted those interviews and wrote those articles, I was viewing trends through my own lens and filter, the slow flowers perspective. When I shared that PowerPoint deck with editors and had positive responses, as in they took it seriously during our meetings... I later decided to post the 10 insights on my blog and record a Slow Flowers podcast episode about that list. And you can go back and listen to episode 174 from December 31st, 2014 to hear what I said. The PowerPoint deck I shared with editors became a blog post and, as I mentioned, the podcast show notes. Then I shared it with Slow Flowers members in my monthly newsletter and then a few floral trade publications picked it up. And as a result, I became an accidental forecaster, and that has elevated Slow Flowers' unique and relevant viewpoint in the floral marketplace. I've learned some valuable lessons. We're no longer waiting for Martha Stewart or Oprah or Chip and Joanna to tell us what's on trend. Each of us can speak with an authentic voice about our observations, key cultural shifts, and new creative directions in the floral space. In the end, the forecast is a tool, a roadmap that helps me and others consider what is around the bend or across the horizon. It sparks conversation, and sometimes, to be honest, it sparks controversy. But it is unforgettable and influential. 
So let's get started. I have 10 insights to share with you for the year to come. I'm calling our 2021 Slow Flowers Floral Insights and Industry Forecast Report In Pursuit of Nature. And you can understand why, right? As we enter 2021, at least in the short term, not much will feel different from the past nine months. And if there's anything we've learned since mid-March of 2020, it's the essential and irreplaceable role of flowers and plants for our survival. And that's why my outlook is deeply connected to humankind's pursuit of nature and how floral entrepreneurs like you can and should tap into and enhance that pursuit through your efforts. I learned about the term biophilia in October of 2019 when I interviewed Tom Precht and Sarah Dakin of Grateful Gardeners. Tom is a big advocate of biophilia, and he opened my eyes to its relevance as we make personal and business decisions that impact our planet's survival. He discussed the definition when I interviewed him, but here it is again, according to Miriam Webster, a hypothetical human tendency to interact or be closely associated with other forms of life in nature, biophilia. Well, all you have to do is read the headlines of 2020 to see a collective shift toward nature, plants, the environment, and yes, flowers. A recent article in the Washington Post caught my attention. The headline reads, The isolation of the pandemic caused her to form a new and intense relationship to nature. She was hardly alone. It went on to say, The benefits of being outdoors for your physical and mental well-being are well documented, but in this coronavirus era, they may be immeasurable. Then I saw a Forbes headline reading, nature is good for your mental health. Sometimes, I'm not sure what that means. The University of Washington shared this research, dose of nature at home could help mental health, well-being during COVID-19. The report stated, studies have proven that even the smallest bit of nature, a single tree, a small patch of flowers, a house plant, can generate health benefits, wrote Kathleen Wolf, a UW research social scientist in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. She continues, look closely in your neighborhood and the bit of nature you may have taken for granted up until now may become the focus of your attention and help you feel better. What are we watching for in 2021? The Slow Flowers community's experiences of 2020 definitely inform what is top of mind for the year to come. Over the past several years, we've devoted considerable time and resources to educating consumers and professionals alike. And thankfully, we are coming off of a year when the attention of many turned to the Slow Flowers movement. Locally grown, seasonal and sustainable flowers addressed questions about a safe and reliable supply of flowers. Awareness of our movement increased as floral consumers and florists alike shifted their focus to what's closer to home. Panic over the international floral supply chain quickly turned to a subtle but significant and newfound understanding that if we don't nurture and support our local flower supply, there may come a day when farmland has been converted to real estate developments, where commitment to a safer, more sustainable earth has been displaced by conveniences. The anecdotal feedback I'm hearing is heartening. I received an email recently from a leader in, shall I say, the mainstream floral industry. She wrote this, Deborah, after two decades of thinking traditional wholesaler connections were the only way to run a floral shop or studio, I'm slowly starting to learn about local flower farmers, and I'm constantly in awe of their entrepreneurial spirit. I can't imagine how much hard work goes into what they do. For that, I want to give them as much business as I can. I know that you had a big hand in getting this trend in motion, and I thank you for that. As we seek new and diverse voices in the Slow Flowers movement, I believe we will continue to witness a positive shift to a more progressive, inclusive, conscious marketplace for the flowers you grow and design with. And we will continue to document the shift with stories, interviews, and resources to encourage you. I want to thank everyone who took the time to respond to our 2021 Slow Flowers member survey, more than 200 of you, who I mentioned during last week's Year in Review report. It's triple past year's participation. 
In addition to the survey, which asked members to share about their floral businesses, including emerging themes and topics important to them, this forecast is informed by my 2020 storytelling, first-person interviews for print and digital Slow Flowers journal stories, interviews with more than 100 Slow Flowers podcast guests, and conversations with thought leaders in floral design, flower farming, and related creative professions. I hope you find these insights and the 2021 forecast valuable to you. You may hear some themes that resonate with you, and I'd love to hear your feedback and suggestions about what you agree with and what topics you wish we included. You can download a PDF of the 2021 forecast in today's show notes for episode 487 at DebraPrinzing.com, and you'll find links and photos as well in the show notes. So let's jump right in and get started as I unveil our report in pursuit of nature. Insight number one, floral wellness. The yearning for a connection to nature is truly unprecedented in our society, something many of you witnessed firsthand when Mother's Day 2020 shattered prior year's records for floral sales. Demand added up to three words, people need flowers. In past forecasts, I've touched on similar themes, including the popularity of aromatherapy bars in 2018 and the year of the houseplant in 2019. Floral wellness is more sweeping in its meaning. More than ever, consumers and their senses are drawn to your blooms. They are drawn for fragrance and scent, for medicinal qualities, for skin and body care benefits, for nutritional meals and palate-satisfying beverages, and for, above all, their mental health. I define floral wellness as an embrace of the therapeutic importance of flowers, both in our own environments and as a meaningful way to share with others. Floral wellness nurtures a positive and habitual desire to have flowers in our lives and as an expression of our desire for others to also experience flowers' emotional, physical, mental, and psychic value. This idea can be manifested in ways both simple and accessible to your clients, as well as more ambitious endeavors. From the rise of flower workshops in person at a safe distance or in many virtual forms, to the explosion of CSA subscriptions as more consumers desired more flowers, the theme of floral wellness took root in 2020 and is yours to nurture and enhance with new offerings to your community in 2021. A few comments bubbled up from our 2021 member survey that underscored this idea, and I'll share them here. This is what some of our respondents said. People want more flowers, more local and more of it. I believe local will become more desired. People want to bring more flowers into their homes and are getting into floral design as a hobby. Flowers bring smiles and happiness in times when we need it most. I think people will be more oriented toward decorating their living spaces, also gifting flowers to loved ones. Customers may start treating themselves with fresh flowers. As work from home becomes normalized, the interest in gardening, flowers, and nature continues to grow. I'm seeing a desire for more beauty and more positivity. This insight's key takeaway for you is this. Use a megaphone to share your story, your flowers, and your belief that flowers are essential to our wellness and health. Insight number two, the virtual florist. What do I mean by the virtual florist? We're living in a world of virtual everything, so the term is truly relevant and timely. In the Slow Flowers community, we spent 2020 covering the ascent of virtual floristry through our podcast interviews, in Slow Flowers Journal stories, and during our weekly and monthly Slow Flowers member virtual meetups. For the virtual florist, innovation and creativity meet a marketplace of COVID-imposed limitations and constraints. The virtual florist is adaptable, flexible, and inventive in finding ways to successfully deliver flowers to his or her community. The virtual florist utilizes technology and serves customers' needs where they are. The virtual florist disrupts definitions of what type of florist you may have been in the past. This means you might own a retail flower shop, but you've added an online shop, or you're studio-based, but you now offer everyday flowers through contact-free curbside delivery, or 
You've never grown flowers before, but this year you've planted thousands of tulip bulbs to sell from your front porch using only your neighborhood's Facebook page to get out the word. That's a real story about one of our members. The Virtual Florist consults, teaches, and inspires in new ways too. Virtual floristry is more egalitarian and transparent. Anyone can turn on a camera and film a demonstration or tutorial for IGTV, Facebook Live, YouTube, and on other platforms. The field is more level than before. It's not just the big names who are attracting audiences, especially because the return to expensive in-person workshops will be slow and gradual. This insight's key takeaway for you is this. Dial up your imagination. What may have begun as a coping mechanism to stay busy or stimulate creativity is now a new business opportunity. Develop and invest time and resources into at least one virtual component of your floral enterprise. Be ready to connect with your community whose shopping habits have dramatically changed, perhaps forever. Insight number three, flowers in a box. Shipping flowers is nothing new, but until this moment, only a few successful companies were getting it right. In our 2018 forecast, I identified the early adopters behind this shift with the Insight Flower Farmers Launch Direct Ship Wholesale Programs. So what's new about flowers in a box? Now, based on necessity, we are witnessing more consumer direct models designed to move local and seasonal flowers from point A to point B, with more Slow Flowers members experimenting in the world of boxed and shipped blooms. Slow Flowers members who had never before shipped flowers began to do so in 2020. The first report we shared about this shift can be heard in early April when I interviewed Mandy O'Shea of Three Porch Farm about the decision to ship early spring flowers when local farmers markets and on-farm sales were impossible due to COVID. It was a survival strategy that foreshadowed a strategic business shift. You can find a link to that conversation in our show notes. It's episode 448. Flowers in a Box covers a diversity of methods and formats, from overnight shipping of bulk flowers, arrangements, floral packages for weddings, and more. Members are also experimenting with the shipping of dried flowers and live plants. And others are including design tutorials in the mix, a nod to Insight Number 2 and the Virtual Florist. This past fall, we published a six-part Slow Flowers Journal series called New Floral Marketing Models and Platforms. I'll share the link for you to go back and read the series in case you missed it. One of the series' most interesting themes, to me, explores how designers and flower farmers are partnering to create boxed floral collections for home-based floral enthusiasts. Check out my stories about Petals by the Shore, Postal Petals, and Flora Fun Box as examples. We will be tracking more of this flowers in a box phenomenon moving into 2021, relying on our membership in Cal Flowers, the only national trade group that offers flower farmers and floral designers access to deep discounts on overnight shipping rates. Cal Flowers has joined the upcoming Slow Flowers Summit 2021 as a supporting sponsor, and we'll be sharing more about this organization in future programs. This insight's key takeaway for you is this. Ask yourself, what can you put in a box, perishable or non-perishable, and offer to customers who are not in your physical marketplace, but who want to share and experience your brand? Insight number four, botanical activism. 2020 was a year in which I stepped back to evaluate whether my beliefs and values were in alignment with my brand, and I know this was the case for many of you as well. We highlighted cause-related flowers in our 2018 forecast, citing the news that more flower farmers and florists were investing their talents to help nonprofits and others in their communities through floral philanthropy efforts. The contributions of so many of our members, growers and designers alike, continue to impact our communities. It began with the simple question, did you donate your flowers to any causes or charities this past year? So many of you can answer in the affirmative. But something is different now. We've all been touched by the awareness that the social and environmental landscape is dramatically changing. And if we do not step up to walk the talk in our own floral enterprises, I believe we are only deceiving ourselves. I define botanical activism as one expression of social enterprise. For Slow Flowers members, this is taking shape in many ways. People are writing statements of purpose for their brands. People are committing resources to racial equity, inclusion, and representation in their business practices. 
People are using their flowers to speak volumes about the issues they care about, from climate change to human rights. And yes, you may occasionally feel the sting of criticism. I've seen it in social media posts along the lines of this type of comment. I just want to see beautiful flowers, and I come here for a respite away from the conflict and disagreements that I watch or hear on the news. Why do you have to be so political here on a floral feed? I believe we can no longer stay comfortable in our safe flower worlds when others are suffering discrimination and injustice. I'm not saying we need to become full-time activists. We have businesses to run, bills to pay, households to support, of course. But even in small and subtle ways, we can be botanical activists to signal our values and beliefs. Your answers in the 2021 Slow Flowers member survey revealed your beliefs and passion for causes important to your brands. 61% of our members say they are taking steps to create inclusion, representation, and equity policies for their businesses. 53% of our members are aligning their brands with human rights and social justice messaging and activities. And 46% of our members' businesses have participated in cause-related activities to support Black Lives Matter and anti-racism campaigns. In 2020, I witnessed the manifestation of these values across the Slow Flowers membership. Inspired by so many of you, your efforts to take a stand for social justice and to show positive support through your flowers. Moving forward, this isn't optional. It's essential. For Slow Flowers, we are adding a sixth statement to the Slow Flowers Manifesto, originally written in 2017 and published in Slow Flowers Journal. Every one of the five original statements in our manifesto could be considered by some to be radical and norm-busting in the conventional sense. They include committing to the following practices, to recognize and respect the seasons by celebrating and designing with flowers when they naturally bloom, to reduce the transportation footprint of the flowers and foliage consumed in the marketplace by sourcing as locally as possible, to support flower farmers, small and large, by crediting them, when possible, through proper labeling at the wholesale and consumer level, to encourage sustainable and organic farming practices that respect people and the environment, and to eliminate waste and the use of chemical products in the floral industry. Today, I am adding a sixth statement, long in coming and inspired by the actions of many of our members and colleagues in the green profession. It is this to proactively pursue equity, inclusion, and representation in the floral marketplace, consciously valuing black floral professionals, that's farmers, florists, designers, and vendors, in our business practices with as much support as we give to environmental sustainability. I recently came across a wonderful affirmation from San Francisco-based diversity and inclusion expert Arthur Chan of Arthur Chan Consulting, and it resonates with this new addition to our manifesto. He wrote, diversity is a fact, equity is a choice, inclusion is an action, belonging is an outcome. This insight's key takeaway for you and for me is that belonging implies community, And my pledge to each of you is to model this value in all of Slow Flowers' actions, programs, content, and investments, not just for 2021, but beyond. As I said last week in our year in review, until the Slow Flowers Society looks more like the communities we live and work in, more needs to be done. So in the coming year, we will be highlighting your botanical activism. What causes are your flowers supporting? How are you enhancing your community and sharing your values? Please keep me posted as I seek stories of equity and inclusion and continue the conversation. Insight number five, theater of the tabletop. The inspiration for this insight arrived in my inbox in October when a college friend of mine sent a link from The Guardian, a UK daily newspaper. The headline reads, napkins are the new fashion, the improbable rise of tablescaping. Written by lifestyle reporter Hannah Marriott, the article captured my imagination as she likens tabletops to our own personal stages for artistic expression. She wrote, It was in lockdown, perhaps inevitably, that tablescaping became a phenomenon. With so many of us working from home, our social lives disappearing and desperate for some comfort, our focus on our homes was never sharper. The article continues, tablescaping, a small joy that can take a few minutes or a few hours and makes dinner time always instantly prettier, is part of this national self-soothing. 
The person who shared this article with me, my friend Scott Whitman, is a creative director who has spent his own COVID year exiled in the Kent countryside away from his London office. He has invested all of his free time photographing the blooms in his garden to document the passing of time season by season. It helps that his pre-Georgian cottage is surrounded by an acre of traditional cottage gardens planted about 40 years ago. That's priceless inspiration. Scott's garden and his photography project led him to produce an entire product line for the table, including dishes and linen tablecloths and napkins adorned with his graphic and polychromatic botanical photography. He plans on debuting the Gate Cottage Garden collection at the 2021 Chelsea Flower Show, and I've been urging Scott to figure out distribution in the U.S. For now, check out images of his garden-inspired table accessories in our show notes and follow him on Instagram at Scott Whitman Art Sculpture. As I pulled together insights for 2021, I couldn't forget this old new idea of tablescaping, and it came up again in several conversations, including most recently with Susan Chambers, a Slow Flowers florist based in San Francisco. She described to me how her business, Bloomin' Couture, has changed in 2020, with more residential floristry accounts than ever. It goes beyond flowers, Susan says. So much of what I'm hearing my clients say is that they want to understand not just the floristry, but creating that moment at the table. They want me to create the vision, the pomegranates, the privet berries dripping out of the arrangement. They want me to come in and create that moment for them before the dinner party. Tablescaping can be the ultimate slow flowers expression as your florals enhance human interactions, mark occasions both special and ordinary, and celebrate the art of dining. Many of you design tablescapes for styled shoots, some of the most adventurous and theatrical meals imaginable. Let's celebrate the objects we cherish and create palettes that honor both how food is grown and the origin of the floral decor. I view the theater of the tabletop as a way to honor the gift of time. This insight's key takeaway for you. How can you combine your flowers and floral designs into a full package? Hannah Marriott's article in The Guardian triggers so many ideas that you'll want to explore in 2021. She writes, Thanks to social distancing and unbridled screen time, the tablescape hashtag now has 455,000 Instagram posts and counting. And it is lifting sales during the crisis. In lockdown, with the hospitality industry on pause, tablescaping took a different direction. For one thing, it provided an income stream, or at least a trickle, to companies whose businesses might have capsized in the crisis. Okay, we're halfway through the forecast, so let's take a moment to spotlight our next sponsor. Thanks to Mayash Wholesale Florist. Family owned since 1978, Mayash is the premier wedding and event supplier in the U.S., and we're thrilled to partner with Mayash to promote local and domestic flowers, which they source from farms large and small around the U.S. Learn more at mayash.com. Insight number six reversing climate change. Last year in the 2020 Floral Insights and Industry Forecast, I featured climate change for the first time with an insight titled Responding to Climate Change. The urgency felt by the Slow Fires community is heightened as we move into 2021. Your responses to climate change questions in the Slow Fires survey reveal that urgency. It can seem overwhelming, but our individual actions and the policies we collectively support are powerful tools to employ as a community. Last year, 44% of our survey respondents said they were adjusting growing practices to adapt to climate change. In this year's survey, 54% of members say they are aligning their brands with climate change messaging and activities. We also asked you to share about how climate change affected you and your business. And here is a recap. Nearly 60% of you cite weather irregularities, too much or too little rain. Equal numbers of you, approximately 30%, cite abnormally warm or abnormally cold spring seasons. One quarter cite the early frost arrival. Nearly 20% blame disaster-related damage, such as wildfire, flooding, hurricane, hailstorms, tornadoes, and other weather tragedies. And there were other reasons cited, including the mention of extended hot periods with no precipitation. One respondent put it this way, weather seems more extreme and unpredictable. Another wrote, it's not at disaster level yet, but the damaging winds and rains devastated my cosmos and the smoke from the fires sullied my white roses and straw flowers this past year. 
Well, what can we do? What active steps are you taking to address climate change in your farm, shop, or studio? We know about and have covered the importance of no-till farming methods, cover crops, crop rotation, raised beds, water-efficient irrigation, and other practices. We know florists are more actively than ever rejecting single-use plastics and other chemical-based products in their designs. What else? In the coming year, Slow Flowers commits to more reporting on your efforts to reverse climate change, efforts that will inspire others and will empower our members to take positive action in small and large ways. For now, this insight's key takeaway for you is this. Educate yourself. I've collected a useful fact sheet with the most informative articles and interviews with Slow Flowers members on the topics of action against climate change, which you can find in our show notes for today's episode. Join me in seeking meaningful change as we strive to protect our climate, environment, communities, and planet. Insight number seven, beyond the hobbyist. The DIY trend has been with us for a decade. And according to my friend and publishing partner, Robin Avni, after that length of time, a trend that was once new, such as do-it-yourself, folds into the broader culture and becomes mainstream. I wanted to call this insight beyond DIY, figure it out. And I turned to Robin to help me flesh out that idea. My idea was that since more consumers than ever are seeking new knowledge, floral enterprises need to be attuned to this reality in order to offer them what they're seeking. But a conversation with Robin gave me a new term, beyond the hobbyist. Robin is my go-to expert when I want to understand what's happening in the consumer marketplace. She spent many years working in consumer research, managing a portfolio of Fortune 500 clients as a senior director and lead consumer strategist at Iconoculture, and as a senior ethnographer at the Hartman Group, where she engaged in primary consumer qualitative research. And those of you who have a copy of my new book, Slow Flowers Journal Volume 1, will know of Robin's influence as a visual artist. She is the creative director for that publication and my partner in the Bloom Imprint, a new book publishing arm of Slow Flowers. According to Robin, DIY is everywhere and thus no longer new. People feel they can access information on YouTube and figure things out themselves, from painting their walls to building a deck to designing an outdoor space, she explains. As an insight, though, Beyond the Hobbyist embodies so much more than DIY, more than saving money or exploring a craft, Robin explains. It's about embracing a skill that gives you a sense of pride and feeds your soul, she says. It's about having a deeper, long-lasting connection to that skill, such as flower gardening or floral design. She continues, people want to learn new skills, but then they want to fold it into their lifestyle. They want to go beyond something superficial. They want to know that when they gather flowers from the farm stand, they can replicate at home what they learned in your design class. Thanks to your class, they understand why it's important to support the stems and change the water regularly. I suspect this sentiment is a driving force behind the popularity of product lines like the Holly Chapel Syndicate Supply Egg and Pillow Mechanics, available not just to the trade, but to the enlightened floral enthusiast who wants to use the same tools and supplies that the pros use. Similarly, having the ability to order single units of the Floral Genius Pin Frogs means these professional tools are getting into the hands of anyone who wants to elevate their floral design practice. It's all about intentionality rather than a random DIY experience. We will continue to witness this urge to both know a skill and understand the why and how behind it, Robin explains. For example, once a customer experiences a flower farm, they want more. They don't necessarily want to be a flower farmer, but they want to understand how to grow their own cut flowers and nurture that practice through the seasons for their own enjoyment and to share with friends and family. We talked about this further, and what came to mind is the desire among many consumers to have a daily practice, and that led to my friend Lorene edwards Forkner, Seattle Times gardening columnist, author, and artist. Lorene's Instagram feed, at Gardener Cook, features her daily practice called Seeing Color in the Garden. Lorene is a past guest of this podcast, and she'll share her story and talents at the 2021 Slow Flowers Summit leading participants in her mindful practice of painting small watercolor studies of plants and other items she collects from nature. You can see more in our Slow Flowers Mercantile store, where we have a digital download gallery of Lorene's work. 
While learning a new skill and adopting a practice is useful for all floral professionals, the key takeaway from this insight is actually a challenge question to you. How do you help your customers and clients embrace a more meaningful connection to flowers? How can you create and nurture opportunities that go beyond DIY hobbies and convert your customers into floral practitioners? When you draw back the curtain and share insider knowledge that your clients and customers can incorporate into their lifestyles, you build deeper engagements. People want to know the professional skills of growing and design. They don't necessarily want to adopt a new profession, but you can interpret and empower them with skills, knowledge, and confidence. Learning and gathering knowledge is more important than ever. What services, products, and experiences can you offer to your marketplace in 2021? What are you teaching and sharing? A final thought, one that I learned while developing online courses for the Slow Flowers Creative Workshop. Teach what you know. Nothing is more authentic. Insight number eight, marketplace access and land equity. This insight is closely connected to insight number four, botanical activism while also addressing two themes essential to the future survival of the floral economy. The first topic, marketplace access, speaks to the importance of proactively changing our business practices to support floral enterprises owned by the BIPOC community, that's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. For so long, I focused my energies on the belief that our floral profession would survive if only consumers learned to ask where were these flowers grown and what growing practices were used to grow them. If there's one important lesson from the racial awareness and awakening of 2020, it's that my values demand that I ask a different set of questions, such as, how can I support and shine a light on florists, flower farmers, vendors, and customers who look different than me, a middle-aged white woman? How can I invest in the success of underrepresented and overlooked talent, and in doing so, ensure their successes and my success are equally valued? At Slow Flowers, We enter 2021 with an embrace of inclusivity, representation, and equity in our profession. As I discussed last week, our Professional Development Fund devotes resources to invite Black farmers and florists to join the Slow Flowers Society. You are encouraged to participate in this endeavor by nominating Black farmers and florists in your community to be part of our efforts. Please reach out with your suggestions. Until the Slow Flowers Society looks more like the communities we live and work in, we will not be sustainable. I've learned so much from garden designer and Slow Flowers advocate, Leslie Bennett, who earlier this year joined me as a return podcast guest. Leslie owns Pine House Edible Gardens, an Oakland-based design-build landscape studio. She's the creator of Black Sanctuary Gardens, which believes that gardens are places that provide respite and restoration, healing and inspiration. The Black Sanctuary Gardens project creates and documents garden sites where Black women's creativity, spirituality, and human experience can be cultivated and nurtured. Slow Flowers donated to the Black Sanctuary Gardens project in 2020, and we feel grateful to learn from the example Leslie is modeling, using her talents and resources to design and build gardens where transformative change can take place and where we can work to grow the world we want for ourselves and our communities. Leslie and the team behind the Black Sanctuary Gardens project are curating their time and talent to create safe and beautiful garden spaces that celebrate black women's humanity and the communities they hold dear within the Oakland, California area. Financial contributions allow them to provide their gifts at low to no cost to these valued community members. This is a model I'd love to see replicated across the community and other regions. The second theme included in insight number eight is land equity. Joining progressive voices in domestic agriculture to advocate for land equity is a cause I believe will benefit the Slow Flowers community as we see much needed diversity and representation in flower farming. In 2020, we financially supported Soul Fire Farm. Based in Grafton, New York, Soul Fire Farm was co-founded by past podcast guest Leah Penniman, author of Farming While Black. She is a Black Creole educator, farmer, author, and food justice advocate whose mission is to end racism in the food system and reclaim an ancestral connection to the land. As co-executive director of Soul Fire Farm, Leah is part of a team that facilitates food sovereignty programs, including farmer trainings for black and brown people, a subsidized food distribution program for people living under food apartheid, and domestic and international organizing toward equity in the food system. 
Soulflower Farm recently provided us with a list of well-established Black-led farming organizations, and I'll share it in today's show notes for you to check out. Please consider following and supporting the farming organizations in your community as we move into 2021, while seeking a more diverse Soulflower's community that benefits all. Insight number nine, opposite palettes. Last year, 24% of our Slow Flowers survey respondents cited yellow as their top color prediction for 2020. Yellow edged out all other colors by single digit percentages, but there was still no clear standout, leading me to predict a polychromatic rainbow palette for 2020. Well, here we are in January 2021, and Pantone already has declared illuminating a glowing shade of yellow as one of two colors for 2021. For the 2021 survey, both yellow and orange topped your list. Specific percentages break out as follows. 23% of you cited shades of yellow and shared comments such as yellow for optimism, mustards and mobs, from rich masala yellows and curries to lavish buttercream yellow on cupcakes, the comfort of food will translate to floral expressions. I love that. 19.5% chose orange and said this, I think we are seeing hints of orange and yellow with pinks and blush, everything across the range of citrus tones to fruity apricot. 14% cited shades of green, the clean feeling of green with foliage in an array of green tones and various shapes, you said. 13% selected shades of purple and violet, saying, I think we will see a trend towards subdued jewel tones that play off of each other. I find the possibilities with purple are both complementary and contrasting and love finding those matches. People also seem to really gravitate to the purple tones, or at least that's what I think, maybe because I like purple flowers so much. 4.5% of you cited red. Reds, burgundies, pinks, monochromatic was the comment. And 3% cited shades of blue, mellow, soft blues. The world needs calming tones in these crazy times. All of these I could agree with, right? So what notable color palette do we predict will influence flower farming and floral design in the coming year? I flipped to the color section of my book, Slow Flowers, to see what I wrote back in 2013. I quoted Harold Piercy, former principal of the Constance Spry Flower School in England, who wrote this in 1983. In flower arranging, I have always found it advisable to discard any preconceptions about colors. He went on to write, Keep an open mind and do not be ruled by the color wheel. You may hit upon unexpected, satisfactory results during your experiments. I dove deep into the comments that you shared in response to the survey's question number 23. Describe in more detail your floral palette predictions. And I have to give a huge congratulations to the many Slow Flowers survey responses that were spot on about yellow. Yellow has been with us for a while. In fact, in 2017, the Slow Flowers floral forecast predicted soft yellows in an insight titled Beyond Blush. It has taken four years since then for Pantone to finally agree with us. Let me include a few of your comments here so you can congratulate yourselves on nailing Pantone's color declaration for 2021, an important emerging floral palette we forecast here years ago. You said this, I'm only wishing. I have lemon chiffon peonies that I would love to see a bump in desire for. I'm into yellow lately. Cream mustard, pale yellow, happy shades. More sunny, happy color. Bright, positive, with an endless summer-like feeling. Pale yellows to golden tones. Yellow is inherently cheery, and I think people will want more good cheer. Also, floral designers have been trying to sell clients on yellow and mustard forever. Maybe this is our year that clients will finally go for it. Orange or yellow, we need some brightness in 2021. Soft, buttery yellows. Yellow is building momentum, and there are so many shades that blend well with the popular muddy neutral palettes. Soft, light, buttery yellow. I'm seeing more demand for yellow flowers. 2020 has been a dark year, and I think we could all use a little sunshine in our future. Warm yellows, amber, mustard, butter, seen alone or with accents in deeper shades. After the pandemic, we want life. We will want color and variety. Yellow was a very big color in fashion just before the pandemic, and I think it will be picked up again after. I think the soft yellows and warm golden colors are what we need for 2021. We need a soft, glowing hug after 2020. 
Clearly, we all love yellow, but of course, we do not want to follow Pantone. Let's move beyond a single hue and explore what's coming next. I predict the most exciting floral palettes will feature complementary and contrasting colors. With color pairs that reside opposite each other on the color wheel, combinations and variations of, of course, yellow and purple, but also interpretations of red and green, orange and blue. What do you think of opposite palettes? A few survey comments jumped out to me in agreement. Oranges reaching out in different directions, yellow, reds, or complementary purple. Purples combined with pale yellows, oranges, and whites. I find the possibilities with purple are both complementary and contrasting, and I love finding those matches. Pink, peach, coral, orange, yellow, and then contrasting with blue. So a little bit of affirmation for that idea. What is the key insight here for you? Simply that we live in a colorful floral world and we need to experiment more. And finding ways to excite customers and clients with new, shall we say, contrasts and compliments is on the horizon. At the core of it, this insight reinforces the importance of selling color as a much desired product. Remember, you and your flowers are ready to meet consumers' hunger for more color in their lives. Insight number 10, star quality. All of a sudden, miraculously in 2020, celebrity florists are taking center stage alongside chefs and fashion designers. Whatever you think about floral competition television, seeing flowers and plants in the hands of professional designers on programs like Netflix's Big Flower Fight and HBO's In Full Bloom definitely felt validating. We are witnessing flowers elevated in mainstream TV programming, and that's news worth celebrating. I lived vicariously through both programs and was honored to host Big Flower Fight's head judge, Kristen Griffith Vanderyat, as a guest on the Slow Flowers podcast and profile him for a florist review cover story earlier this year. I'll share those links in today's show notes. I also enthusiastically rooted for a Sperry AIFD PFCI, another past guest of this podcast, who competed in HBO's In Full Bloom. I won't spoil it for you if you haven't watched to the finale, but you can learn much more about Ace in episode 421, originally aired in October of 2019. I felt quite the same sense of pride earlier this year when the popular Fleur de Ville's exhibition came to Seattle's Northwest Flower and Garden Festival. With flowers transformed into wearable fashions displayed on a parade of mannequins, it clearly was the most popular feature of the Flower and Garden Festival. The success of Fleur de Ville's is similar to the buzz created by the two floral competition shows I just mentioned, and a total of nine Slow Flowers members in the Seattle area competed in the Fleur de Ville exhibition, so I was super proud of them. I was delighted to interview Karen Marshall and Tina Barkley, the creatives behind Fleur de Ville, which I call a bespoke floral phenomenon. I had them on the Slow Flowers podcast this past February. Much like the response people have when they see the photo shoots of real models wearing botanical couture for our American Flowers Week campaigns, which Slow Flowers has been commissioning since 2016, the botanical couture on Fleur de Ville's three-dimensional mannequins takes floral fashion to a new level. What is the magic? I believe that seeing flowers used as an artistic expression ignites the imagination of those who view them. Beyond the sheer scale and beauty of floral installations, massive topiary, and botanically dressed mannequins, flowers are the starting point that connects many consumers with the natural world. And who can argue with that? For Fleur de Ville, showgoers were invited to vote for their favorite designs. For Big Flower Fight and In Full Bloom, viewers rooted for their favorite contestants. There's buy-in when the audience has a stake in the outcome. And ultimately, more people know more about flowers, which takes us full circle to our insight number one, floral wellness. I hope to see all these floral celebrity projects return to our lives in 2021, but I will offer a vocal plea for one change. Please, no floral foam. As we've urged the mainstream floral profession for years, please wean yourself from a dependence on foam. Be truly creative and find alternative mechanics to express your art. It can be done, believe me. We've consistently documented no foam mechanic strategies on this podcast and in our other Slow Flowers channels. For goodness sakes, even the famed Chelsea Flower Show has declared future exhibitions to be foam-free. 
If you're interested in showing off your own star quality, I invite you to join the 2021 American Flowers Week Botanical Couture Creative Team. Our creators are Slow Flowers member florists and flower farmers who produce wearable botanical couture that's photographed on live models for publication. On Friday, January 15th, you're invited to join me for a free webinar and learn how you can participate in American Flowers Week 2021. Hear advice and tips from Slow Flowers member designers and growers. We will discuss how each created an iconic botanical couture look for American Flowers Week, including flower sourcing, model selection, and photography. You can join the webinar to learn whether this opportunity is right for you. Find the link to register in today's show notes. The webinar takes place at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern on Friday, January 15th. Okay, what an inspiring list of 10 insights. Thank you for reviewing this list with me today. I want to pause here to marvel at what has happened since I began writing down what I viewed on the horizon for the Slow Flowers movement and its followers and members. The simple act of speaking, writing, and sharing one's perspective is a personal superpower, one you can also claim, because each of us has an utterly unique worldview. While it seems trite to seek out COVID's silver linings, you may find meaningful truths to interpret from the past year's chaos. Use them as a foundation for your 2021 planning. Yes, you want to make resolutions and set goals. You can also set your intention. An intention can be our rudder to guide us through choppy waters and uncertain times. That's clearly what we need in this moment. Our final sponsor thank you goes to The Gardener's Workshop, which offers a full curriculum of online education for flower farmers and farmer florists. Online education is more important this year than ever, and you'll want to check out the course offerings at thegardenersworkshop.com. The Slow Flowers podcast has been downloaded more than 675,000 times by listeners like you. Thank you for listening, connecting, and sharing. It means so much. As our movement gains more supporters and more passionate participants who believe in the importance of our domestic cut flower industry, the momentum is contagious. I know you feel it too. I value your support and invite you to show your thanks to support Slow Flower's ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button in the column to the right at deborahprinzing.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of the Slow Flowers podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more American-grown flowers on the table, one vase at a time. And if you like what you hear, please consider logging onto iTunes and posting a listener review. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. The Slow Flowers Podcast is engineered and edited by Andrew Brenlin. Learn more about his work at soundbodymovement.com. Thank you.